All right. It looks like we're live here. So in just a moment, we're going to be going and joining my wife, Laura, uh, and we're going on a wild edible plant walk today. So Chris Gilmore here uh, from chrisoutdoors.ca, as well as uh, wildmuskoka.com. Wild Muskoka is our wild foraging. Uh, so we make sustainably wild forage foods and drinks, and we also do mushroom and edible plant walks. And it just so happens today, we have a whole bunch of folks over on the homestead here. Um, and my wife, Laura, is leading them on an edible plant walk. So we're going to go join her in just a moment uh, and, yeah, take you on a little bit of a tour. Um, so these are participants that have signed up for a one-day workshop to go and get an intro to foraging. And um, you're going to get just a bit of a sneak peek. We'll maybe go follow her for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, I can't promise that the audio and video will be perfect as I move further away from the Wi-Fi, uh, but we'll give it a shot. One of Laura and I's goals this year is actually to do a little bit more live streaming and video just to give you a little bit of a, a glimpse at kind of what our, our lifestyle looks like as professional foragers, outdoors folks, homesteaders, things of that nature. I wonder if anyone knows this plant beside me right there, though. This is a gorgeous one that's just started flowering inside of our homestead right now. Um, that's our bloodroot flower right there. And we've got some Solomon seal coming up over here. Um, all kinds of fun stuff coming up. But um, why don't we go over and we'll see Laura right now. So I'm just going to walk over. I'm going to kind of sneak in quietly because she's actually teaching this class live. Uh, if anyone has questions while we're going, feel free to post them. But yeah, we'll go and watch Laura right now. So we'll be there in just a second, folks. Yeah, but we actually, I'll do like a sweet one. So you can, so when you do the egg, put lemon in the egg and then I will do the crispy panko batter. Mm -hmm. So then you do, so you have lemon in the egg, you do the dip and then the panko and then fry and then drizzle them with honey. Mm -hmm. So good. Like mm -hmm. just a different way to think about and then it's almost like a dessert. Mm -hmm. I did, I had like a cayenne infused honey too that I did. So it's like spicy honey. Um, but yeah, that's just like, you know, like zucchini flowers, but also thinking of it as like kind of a fun dessert. The important thing to remember though is that the dandelion flowers, you guys ever notice that they close up at night? Mm -hmm. So when you pick them, they'll still close up at night in your fridge. <laughs> so if you want to do that dish, you have to pick them and do it the same day. Cool. Otherwise, you'll be very disappointed by the fact that they all close up and then it's not quite the same when you try to fritter them. Oh. Um, but yeah, that's a few I feel like of some of the like maybe lesser talked about uses of that, of the day. Um, yeah, so the, the crown. Yeah, and this is like, I, I chose for some reason the small thing I plan to show you. <laughs> okay. um, but that, uh, but yeah, um, when I start harvesting the roots, like kind of next week, um, we'll definitely do like a few or two of those green crowns. And, yeah, and then saving all those little bits. I have, I have samples of the, of the um, buds. Um, yeah, just, like basically most people, and then it's like, and then they get thrown on salads and like lots of little things. A lot of times they end up getting shared in classes like this. Or like they, their idea of like a caper. The idea of a caper. Mm. Um, so the other little thing I want to show on the lawn, it's a very common one, you mentioned it, is plantain. So. Uh, again, dandelion's non-native, plantain's non-native. We've so far talked about all non-native plants. So plantain is here and here and here and here and here and here. <laughs> I didn't know that was um, I was thinking bananas. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so this is plantago majora. So that's um, this. And it's it's another name for it is a uh, white man's foot. Um, <laughs> because it always shows up in compacted soils um, where settlers um, so it's growing in what's called a basal rosette so all the leaves will always grow from one central base um, and then the leaves are these kind of just like um, oval shaped sometimes they'll have a bit of a teeth but most often they're pretty smooth let's see these leaves are young though oh yeah it's gonna show so when you break a plantain leaf See how it has those strings? Mm. Oh, yeah. That's a key yeah. ID feature. This oh. is actually one of the plants that I will teach really young kids because it has this really tactile thing mm. that kids can like show you that they have the right thing. 
Um, you mm-hmm. technically can eat the young greens. Um, as they're not like my favorite. I could, I definitely would throw some into salads. But uh, the one really fun use I discovered about maybe two years ago was I'll harvest the leaves up until about July. So you want them a little bit big, like I'll wait till they get a bit bigger than this. But by kind of like August, September, they're getting pretty tough and leathery. So when they're still kind of tender, and when I say tender, think about when we're shopping at the grocery store, we all have a good innate sense of what fresh and like not so fresh looks like so use that sense of looking for leaves that look fresh mm. i uh i marinate them in a little bit of soy sauce and sesame oil and then dehydrate them Whoa. and they make chips Whoa. and like we'll like just crush a whole bowl. eating more than i tell you you should when i said eat <laughs> <laughs> that'd be fun to have a plantain banana chip and then your plantain chips side by side yeah there you go all the snacks. Yeah. I used yeah. to actually put them on pizzas when I used to guide up north. When we were out on the trail, we'd make trail pizzas in the cast iron. We'd actually put pan- oh, plantain basil. leaves on the pizza. Oh, yeah, yeah kind of like putting basil on. Yeah, so you didn't yeah. have plantain in backcountry Manitoba. Pardon me? You didn't have plantain in this or, plantain. Sorry, you didn't have basil. In no, Manitoba. we didn't have basil, but we would find this on the portage trail sometimes. Yeah. So we'd put it on the pizzas. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. And then they will send out, actually, these might actually, oh, yeah, these are, these are stems from the plantain last year and they've already dropped all their seeds these are probably all the plantains um but the seeds that form it's actually really interesting there's the seed and then each seed is inside of a husk the husk is the same thing that metamucil is made of oh, fiber yeah. so i've actually harvested the seeds before i'll just like when these when the little seeds are all along here i'll just like go along and like zip and they like all come off and I've dried them and I've just added the seeds to like multi-grain muffins and bread. You could probably yeah, use yeah. it like a, a vegan alternative to an egg, like for oh, you know, like a flax, yeah. like a flax a egg. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 yeah I, think so. I think if you ground yeah. them a bit, yeah. 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 So they're definitely like, and, and in an abundance, like I, last year I left like in the vegetable garden, I had like a, one of the paths were just full of plantain. So I just left that one path full of the plantain and I just used that as my little harvesting patch because here in the lawn they get kind of trampled so I typically will try to when I find like a few nice big plants I'll just kind of let them in our garden we kind of have like we do like the, the beds so I there's like I'll, I'll cultivate the top of the bed and then I tend to let the sides and the like edges of the garden paths be some of my like most favorite useful plants because here they'll get trampled and the dogs out Mm -hmm. um but in the garden i can actually like tend some of them and let them um like kind of grow them like as if they were they just came out on their own but i can like guard them a little bit and tend them to actually be a heart heart, something i'm going to harvest from um and then has some cool like first aid uses like if you get stung by a bee um doesn't work as well for black flies and mosquitoes believe me i've tried but something that injects you with venom like a bee um if i find a plantain leaf and chew it up and put it on um it will um it actually has the action of drawing out so it will draw out the toxin and i've definitely had significant night and day difference of swelling um Mm. in a bee or wasp sting using plantain or not um so super good one just a little first aid use there um and there's lots and lots like every plant we're going to talk about there's probably there's like guaranteed more uses but oh, it's almost like every one of these plants we could do a whole class on right mm-hmm. i'll leave it there there's lots of lots more you can learn about planting um sorry and, if you were stung by a bee do you like kind of apply it to the yeah so i would take either? the leaf so what generally i do because you need to crush this up so i get stuck and, oh i just got stung yeah <laughs> i'm gonna grab so i'll come and i'll find a clean of the leaf Using that exact voice. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then we call this a spit poultice. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that, I mean, sure, you want to find two rocks and smash it between to not touch it. Mm. But the idea is that you just need to get it broken up. Mm-hmm. And then I'll actually like replace that a few times um, if you can, or just like if you got to keep moving on, just throw a bandaid on it, something just to get 
the ideas need to get it kind of broken up so that the juices of the leaf kind of can get in and it, it has that drying action. Cool. Um, what's it taste like? Lettuce. lettuce. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really taste like much. Um, Would you have, so if you're adding that to a salad, like mm -hmm. blanch and... Uh, no, the, these ones, the, the young ones, you can eat raw. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could definitely eat them raw. They really don't taste like much. And so when they sell it at the farmer's market, is it the young ones? Is that what you were saying? Oh, yeah, yeah you were saying people sell Yeah, that is incredible to wow. think of selling, planting. These <laughs> ones? <laughs> what a ripoff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I sell, like, I mean, I have a wild well, food store. I sell pine needles, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I like, sell pine needles. <laughs> Yeah, but it's interesting to think of, right, and I mean, we, the ones, these ones are super small, they will get really big, like the plantains that grow here in front of the house where we're like not right walking on them all the time, the leaves will get this big, hmm. and we actually use, here too, like we do consume it, but then once they start to get really big, they are a really important food source for our rabbits, so we feed them a lot to our rabbits, um, yeah, so it's like really good animal fodder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, super useful. So, like the, my, these are plantains here, then, right? Let's see. Might be. Yeah. You well, know, you said be hundred percent sure. My default is they're always second yep. guess. Yeah, right. all of these, absolutely, all of these are plantain, and then again, that's where I'll just like you want to know. You just grab one of the leaves, and you do that like vein, that strange. And feel free. I mean, these plantains can definitely take being. Feel free to pick one if you want to. To try that out. Um, that portage trip. Oh yeah. <laughs> you like that? Nice. Yeah, you can often because on the portage trails is often where you get the things that go in the disturbed environments. So yeah. They got a bit of extra sun and yeah. So you'll sometimes find edibles on the portage trail. Yeah. And plantains like plantains are really nice non-native plant in the sense it's very well behaved. Like it only grows in the disturbed areas. And if you actually, there is a native variety of plantain um, that if you're ever in the backwoods, it's really like botanically very, like you wouldn't, it's like splitting hairs to tell one species from another. But there is one species of native plantain that grows in the forests. Um, but uh, yeah, so anywhere you find it, you can definitely use any species of that. Okay. String, string. Next one. Um, so it's growing. Here's a patch that's blooming, which is really nice. Um, so there are, this is violets. There are probably at least 20 different species of violets that grow in Ontario. They can be any color um, from this like beautiful dark purple to, um, to white, to white with purple stripes, to yellow. Um, every single species of violet is um, safe for consumption. So they always pretty much grow low to the ground. And it is common to see them growing in these dense mats. So you can see this dense mat here. And it's like dense patches growing all through the lawn. So both leaves and flowers are edible. So I'll harvest some of the leaves and just kind of show them to folks. So they are a heart-shaped leaf, we call it cordate, heart-shaped leaf. And then the flowers are what we call an irregular flower. So unlike a daisy, which is like perfectly symmetrical any way that you cut it, see how we, we cut it, it's only symmetrical down the middle. Like an orchid, exactly. Gorgeous flower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's one of the first things to bloom in the spring. So both leaves and flowers. Um, the leaves of violets are actually exceptionally high in vitamin C. Like a third of a cup of violet leaves is your whole daily vitamin C. Um, and the flowers, I've never, I don't know if, about the nutritional value of them, but they're so lovely to put in like, they smell nice. yeah, they smell nice. And they're lovely to put in salads and I actually have this, I, every year, it's like a very labor intensive process, but I do just fun, make a violet syrup. So you harvest the flowers, 
and then you you steep them in hot water um and you strain out the flowers and what you'll get is a a tea like a it's just so it's just a tea that's bright blue um and then i put it in a saucepan and then you just have like your ratio it's like often like one to two like it's like one two cups of water or the tea it's like one cup of sugar um or sorry it's actually the other way around first of all two cups of sugar for <laughs> one cup of tea it's very strong um but you you put the sugar in and this is the one time other everywhere else in my life i'm like an organic cane sugar kind of girl but when it comes <laughs> to violet syrup i will use white sugar because um the cane sugar will kind of make it go brown but the white sugar will keep it bright so you put it in the saucepan and um it will like you dissolve it and then what's interesting it'll be bright blue and then if you add a few like two tablespoons or so of um, lemon juice it turns it like electric purple like this purple so it's super cool it's like if you you know even just like to see the chemistry of that is really fun wow. um, and then something i actually think i'm going to try this year is i saw someone do a recipe for jelly so then they basically had that syrup and then they mixed gelatin in it and then made these like jelly like like oh, yeah. yeah so i'm like for the for the only time a year i'll like use white sugar it seems so worth it <laughs> and it, it's funny they don't really taste they don't taste that much but it's so fun just to do the color like to get the color mm -hmm. and to play with it so like they're really butterfly shoots yeah with them? totally yeah, people use them like to get the color yeah. yeah so it's kind of that same thing it's butterfly pea it's like much yeah. easier to use than violet but it's this is the one that goes here so cool. that's what i use and is there any health benefits to the flower? Not that I know of. Um, the, the leaves are kind of where you're going to get most of the nutritional value. The other thing with the flowers is probably you'd have to, like, I'm guess. I mean, just looking at the chemistry, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're going to have flowers. But you're, the amount that you probably have to consume to get any, like, benefit. benefit. But the leaves are kind of what's known to be the most benefit. Mm -hmm. I find with the leaves really fresh is my favorite. So fresh in salads. If I'm doing an herbal pesto or something, you know, that you can add them in. Um, but generally, they're, they're something that I'm going to eat fresh. Yeah. And I have, uh, everyone will get a chance to try some of the flowers or feel free to come and taste some of the flowers on their own. Um, the only thing, like, they ju literally just popped. So sometimes there's just, like, a bit of sand because we haven't had, like, a rain. Yeah, so, so the only thing I'll do is sometimes just, like, tap it first. <laughs> like, that's always my, like, unconscious there's actually nothing poisonous here so we're good <laughs> yeah and here's an interesting thing so hot there's a like a garden hosta growing in behind there you can eat the hosta shoots yeah and it's what it's another one of those like asparagus you eat them exactly like this stage when they're first coming up now if you want though a nice lovely pristine looking hosta it's going to look a little raggedy if you harvest the shoots so we actually have another hosta that grows like like i've divided up my hostas and i'll just like throw them in places i'm less likely to to care about if they look nice and then i'll eat those ones <laughs> Or you just steal some from your neighbor's garden. <laughs> but yeah, they, these young pasta shoots um, are, yeah. <laughs> they really just taste, they're very similar to asparagus. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to show you guys one more plant in the garden and we're going to go for a walk. So this is my garden. If anyone's just joining right now, I'm just going to step away for a second. So we're just uh, we're running an edible wild plants walk on our homestead today. Uh, so we got a group here live on the land. We're having a ton of fun. Uh, and I'm basically just following Laura along uh, as she's sharing a ton of wisdom about how to sustainably and ethically uh, grow and forage edible and medicinal plants. 
So let's uh, let's go for a walk back over there. Um, if you're loving this broadcast, then, uh, you know, we'd really appreciate you sharing it, giving it a like. Uh, feel free to comment or ask questions as well as we go along, and I'll be following them uh, as we go here. That's always the caution I have around eating any type of flower that you get in, like, a floral arrangement or from a garden center. If you know that there are things sprayed on it that are not, like, regulated for food. But, like, those little Johnny Jump Ups, those little pansies grow wild in a garden they always kind of like revert back smaller but all those ones you can still use so i want to show you guys one root so there's a plant um there's they're actually all through the garden so there's a native plant called evening primrose um so but often it's funny it's a native plant but it it grows in a lot of people gardens as a weed um and I actually um, will grow them and let them make their way around the garden because um, they actually have a pretty good root. So this is a plant that's called a biennial. So it only lives for two years. So the last year it seeded and grew Probably is like it, just like a small, like it would have been like a black seed in there. So when they're overwintering, and then in the spring, this is what's called the basil rosette. So just the set of leaves that are all coming from a central stalk. Later in the summer, it will start to send out a big shoot. And then it will have these really uh, quite large four petaled yellow flowers, and they're like a king very lemon yellow, really, and super delicate. The flowers are edible, but the reason that I actually let them, so every year I will, I, like when I'm spring cleaning up the spring gardens, we'll harvest a bunch and then I'll always pick one patch to like let bloom and go to seed because these are like a parsnip. Mm -hmm. So as long as I harvest them with just from the young plants in the spring, so it's like, you know, carrot, if anyone here has grown carrots before or parsnips before, they're like very finicky to seed, very finicky to weed, where these guys are root crop that I can, like, I still harvest, you know, I still grow carrots and stuff, but like those guys get harvested in the fall. And then I always know that in our garden, if I always leave some evening primrose around, um, but in the spring, I'll be able to get these, uh, and they're like, I'll, we'll get lots and we'll get a nice nice root crop um but yeah not super sweet so closer to a parsnip um but like a pretty pretty good root veggie especially for something that i didn't actually have to physically plant mm -hmm. um so that's just like one one root crop so yeah it's a, it's common in it's common as like a weed but it is good to know that it is a native plant so it's common like in open areas or yeah areas? being a being so often meadows and again more disturbed areas anyone with like a farm kind yeah. of gardens I read the I mean there's them. a place like there so for example like this was uh so when we planted the peas you know we got our pea crop and then I knew that they were all through there and I just said okay well they're not they're not competing with the peas anymore so they can just have the spot and then i knew that in the spring i would have a place to harvest mm. some roots from wow. so sometimes it's like i i try to you know it's less work if i just let them do this <laughs> <laughs> i'm actually going to put these back in the ground so that they're nice and fresh uh when i come to dig them and that'll be i i mean I will definitely, so I will only ever let like a handful go to seed um, because otherwise we would probably have nothing but that plant. But because it's a plant of disturbed soils, it's it's going to be, at least in some sort of meadow environment, you're not going to find it like in a forest. Yeah. I've found it on portage trails before though again yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> on portage trails. On portage trails, yeah. yeah. Okay, where, where more likely in dry system. soil yeah. than places where you might have moss. It wouldn't yes, be near moss. Absolutely. Moss. It's definitely more of a yeah. plant of dried spots. 
And then what's interesting to think from an ecological function, this is so cool. So plant, so after it goes to seed, it dies. And then that big taproot that I showed you guys. Um, so if you imagine when that, so then that plant dies and that root rots. So what the function of those plants is, is to actually then break up just compacted soils. And then that root is like rich in starches and sugars. So insects come in, it allows water to better penetrate into the ground. So those plants actually have a lot of really good important function for helping build the health of the soils. Um, so I actually, it's another reason like we will kind of let them because they, they are doing work in our gardens to to make them a bit better over time. If I, you know, with with a little management, with, with like working together. Oh, question for you. Mm -hmm. So my doctor actually suggested suggested evening primrose oil for yeah. menopausal, you know, symptoms. So is it the root? Or it's is it actually the so the, the it's the or... it's the seed. So once the flower okay. forms, it has seed. The seeds are incredibly tiny, and then they press the seed for oil. So they actually, I feel like, because I've, I've thought of it before, I've tried so many ways to think of like how you could do it, but you would probably have to grow like this entire garden of nothing but even primrose and then have some sort of fancy, like a machine that can separate the seed and then, and then they actually press it. But yeah, it is a, it is an important It is one that the seed is used um, for helping balance hormones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is really. I'll share a quick it. story just for anybody yeah. who knows anybody suffering from hormonal migraines, like before your period every month. Um, it's the only. It, this works like a camel. We're going to go for a little walk away from there. I don't want to just follow <laughs> Laura around with the camera all day long, uh, just out of respect for her class there. But yeah, hopefully you folks enjoyed those. So Laura just went over uh, dandelion. Uh, violet, hostas, and evening primroses, all as edible wild foods that are often found right around your garden, your lawn, uh, great edibles. Um, just so folks know, I'm going to actually uh, keep going for a little bit here if, if you're still interested. So I'm going to go on a little bit of tour. I'll go over a couple more uh, wild edibles myself in a moment. Uh, I'm also going to show you around the homestead a little bit and show you where we grow our edible mushrooms. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss that in just a moment here. But before I do that, I just wanted to mention, uh, I've got our link for our website up there. So we have a whole host of wild edible uh, food and drink products, things like wild leek vinegar, uh, which is uh, organic, wild leeks infused in organic apple cider vinegar. We use that on like salads. Uh, we put it into stir fries. We put it in this, uh, dressings, all kinds of fun stuff like that. Uh, we make a whole line of spices. Uh, so for example, we do a, a wild uh, salt and the wild salt has Or am I ringing off? Anyways, the wild salt has wild leeks on it. Uh, it has spruce tips in it, and it has uh, sweet gale catkins in it as well. And then it's cut with the salt. So it's a finishing salt that you can basically put on anything um, that you would uh, normally use the salt on. So if these are kind of intriguing you, we also make bitters for both digestion, but also for making cocktails and delicious mocktails. Um, so if all of these things are of interest with you, then, um, then yeah, go over and check out the website. I've got it listed down there, wildmuskoka.com. And we also run these edible plant walks. So if you happen to live in the Ontario area, uh, feel free to join us. I believe all our walks are sold out for this year. They sell out fast. We're sold out. It's May right now. and We're already sold out through the end of October. Um, but get on our newsletter uh, and you can join us on one in the future. So let's get back to chatting about plants. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a detour from the wild plants for a second and just chat a little bit about our mushroom setup. I know some folks might be interested in that. Um, and then we'll cover a couple more plants and then we'll, we'll wrap up the broadcast here. Uh, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to share. So I'm going to show you two things that we have going on here. Maybe we'll start with this one right here. Some of you may know that we also run a uh, mushroom going course. Beside me, we have what's called a log tower. So these are poplar logs that I, I cut green. And in between them, I actually took uh, mycelium from oyster mushrooms and I put them in between the logs. I'm just trying to see if any stands out. There you go. So if you see that white in the middle of the log there, uh, that white is actually oyster mycelium and it's inoculating in between those two logs now. And that's why we call it a log tower. And what's gonna happen in probably about eight weeks or so, 
oyster mushrooms are going to start popping uh, out from in between these cracks in between the logs there. Uh, so that's one technique we do, the log tower. Uh, right here, we actually have a mushroom bed. So this is actually, so just like you'd have a garden bed. So this is a garden bed that grows mushrooms. Now it's in a shady spot. We're behind the house here. And I've got a whole bunch of uh, poplar wood chips in here. And then we put a layer of straw over top of that. And we're, we haven't actually inoculated this one yet. We're going to be inoculating it shortly with wine cap mushrooms. Um, so uh, we've got oysters and wine caps growing right behind the house here. Uh, I'll take you down to the shiitake patch in a moment. But let's, let's just go for a little walk around the garden. We'll look at a couple other things here. Um, if you're just tuning in live, then um, yeah, then you may want to go back and watch the replay afterwards because Laura talked about a bunch of wild foods there uh, in the beginning. She talked about plantain. She talked about violet. Right here is a big, beautiful patch of sweet grass. Oh my goodness, smells so lovely. Mm. So we're just going to walk into the garden here for a second, take a couple, look at a couple other fun projects we have going on right now. Uh, behind me, there's the garlic bread right now. So it's uh, May 7th, I think, today, and our garlic's already sprouting out there. And I bet you our asparagus is going to start popping any day now. But another fun plant that I think would be great to, to chat about right now, uh, this is a really good medicinal plant um, for lots of different things, but particularly um, for if you're dealing with respiratory issues, um, if you've got like some stuck congestion inside of your lungs. And this plant right here, this beautiful fuzzy plant, I feel like it would make a fantastic pillow uh, to just sleep on it. This is called mullen. And this is a second year plant that's coming up here. Um, and when I say second year plant, that means it's gonna send a stalk up the middle of the plant this year. So it's a biennial plant. It has a two year life cycle, this mullen plant. And what basically happens the first year, it grows this, which we call like a basal rosette, um, where they all kind of grow from a central point. Um, and it doesn't raise off the ground. So all the leaves come out of that central point. And then the second year, it'll basically send up this long, tall stalk. Let's see. Oh yeah, here's one right over here. Let's go take a quick look at that. So the second year, it sends up a big, tall stalk. And I bet you you've seen these along the side of the road or highways and fields before. But this long stalk uh, grows beautiful yellow flowers on it. So there's a couple of different things we do with the mullen plant. Um, one of the ones that I, uh, probably the most common ones I do with it is if I ever get a respiratory infection and it feels kind of stuck, like in my lungs, um, like I feel really congested deeply there, then what I'll actually do is I'll harvest these beautiful fuzzy green leaves. Um, and I'll basically get a, a steamer going on my stove or a pot of boiling water. I'll put the mullen into it and then I'll drape a blanket over my head and I'll sit there and I'll actually inhale, uh, the mullen in. Um, down into my lungs and it's phenomenal for helping break up phlegm. Now, as I say this, you know, uh, this is just uh, to inspire you today for educational purposes. Um, I don't recommend uh, learning, um, learning about herbal medicine from a, a live stream YouTube broadcast. You know, um, you want to um, work with a, an actual herbalist. Uh, you know, if you're interested in learning about wild medicine, then go over and check out our wild medicine program. Uh, where we actually dive a lot deeper into. Today is really just for inspiration. So please don't do this because there are things you can do wrong. You can actually develop a serious allergy to mel uh, mullen, which can be detrimental to your health if you do this too often or don't know what you're doing. Um, but just so you know, um, mullen is a plant that you could learn more about to be able to create these herbal steams to help break up congestion. The other thing that we do with it is we harvest those beautiful yellow flowers and uh, we'll make ear oil out of the flowers. So we basically infuse them in olive oil. And if you have like a surface level ear infection, not an inner ear infection, but an outer ear infection, um, I've actually fought off a few ear infections now with the mullen flowers uh, infused in olive oil. So there's a neat one. And then the last one I'll just share here, this beautiful stalk right here. If you knock all of these buds off of here, these little flower buds, so you, I just scrape them off with my finger there. The stalk uh, inside of or underneath those is actually great for doing a technique called the hand drill, where you rub the stalk in between your hands really fast. Um, and you can literally start a fire by rubbing this against a cedar board. Uh, and that's something that I teach in my wilderness survival courses. I've also pouring uh, spruce sap into the little pockets, the little seeds there. And uh, spruce sap, if you don't know, is very flammable. It also has medicinal benefits as well, spruce sap, by the way. But I've poured spruce sap into these little holes before 
Um, and then you can kite it on fire and actually use this mullen stick as a torch that'll burn for quite a long time. You might be surprised. So there's the mullen plant right there. So that's a real fun one if you didn't know it already. Um, let's take a quick look inside of the greenhouse over here. And then uh, I'll show you the mushroom logs kind of as our, our last step. Oh, I got one other wild edible I want to show you in a second here. But quick little tour here. So we, inside the greenhouse, we got lots of fun stuff going on. Um, we got some lemon balm over here that we're going to be planting. Oh my goodness, I love rubbing lemon balm between my fingers. Giving it a smell, phenomenal. Lemon balm, all kinds of great medicinal uh, benefits to having it. Um, we've got all the herbs starting off here, things like oregano, things like thyme. Um, there's all our strawberries coming from our planters. We got our early season, season green, so it's May 7th. Um, and you can see our spinach and our cat soy and our uh, arugula. All three of those plants are really great early season plants. Um, if you seed them, basically as soon as um, as soon as it's uh, kind of just staying above freezing, uh, they'll grow even when it's cold. And in fact, uh, spinach and arugula and tatsoi, spinach specifically out of that group, actually grow better in the early spring than they do later in the season. If you plant spinach in the summertime, it'll often just bolt, meaning it just goes to seed and you don't get a lot of a harvest off of it. Um, but if you plant it in the early part of the season, you're more likely to get a nice crop. And then this is a fun project. We're probably going to do another live stream when we, um, when we actually plant these. But look at all these little sticks sticking out of the soil here. So these are actually all elderberry clippings. And those of you that have been following uh, the Wild Muskoka journey for a while here, you'll know one of our, our favorite products that we sell is our elderberry syrup. Um, a lot of people, now we sell it as a food product, um, but a lot of people buy it because of the known, uh, for one, elderberry is an antioxidant, uh, kind of like blueberries. But a lot of people know, and if you go to the Health Canada website, yeah, you can actually find a whole bunch of scientific studies on there that talk about the role of elderberry syrup in um, reducing the length and severity of colds and flus. So we make this wild crafted elderberry syrup at Wild Muskoka. Um, and this year we're going to be expanding our wildberry, our elderberry patches. So we go and forage in a bunch of spots, but we, these are clippings that we actually bought from a place called Elderberry Grove out on the West coast of Canada. Um, and what they basically do is in the winter time, they take clippings. So they're a couple nodules long, um, off of the last year's fresh growth on the elderberry plant. Um, and then you put them in the fridge basically for the winter time, they mailed them to us. And now we've gone and stuck these elderberry clippings into, uh, some pots. So they're going to start to root inside of the pot. Admittedly, we don't use any rooting hormone or anything like that. So it's literally just a clipping of the fresh growth of last year's elderberry plant. Um, the clippings taken in the winter time and then in the spring we stick it into the soil uh, and it's going to start to root on there so then once these start to root a little bit we're going to be going out and planting a whole field of elderberry bushes so we'll do another live stream and some videos when we're planting the elderberry field um, but for those of you that use our organic wild crafted elderberry syrup you might enjoy seeing how we're actually kind of expanding the elderberry farm and operation um, if anyone's just tuning in right now uh, thanks for joining us um, we're on a wild edible plant walk today. Um, and Laura just did a couple, uh, presentations. I'm going to show you a couple other things around the homestead and then we'll probably wrap this up kind of soon here. Uh, we're taking a little bit of a divergent from the wild edible plants and just talking about how we tend our, our wild homestead here. So another fun one here, this is a, uh, what they call a native plum tree behind me there. You can kind of see it up there. It's fairly large and plums need, um, basically a male and a female part to produce fruit. Um, and you don't get them on the same bush. So you need basically a pollinator bush. Um, but one thing that you can do that's really fun. So we have this native plum that's really established and doing quite well. Um, but um, we don't have any actual nice edible plums here. So I went and took some grafts uh, or some clippings, they call it uh, scion wood, um, off of a, uh, an Italian plum, these big, beautiful green, uh, or sorry, green, these big, beautiful purple plums. Uh, and what I'm going to be doing this year is actually grafting. So taking the clipping off of last year's growth on the Italian plum, and I'm basically going to make a cut and splice them into the Italian plum here. Uh, and then we're going to tape it up and leave it. And, uh, the cells should actually join each other and the bark heal and grow over top of it. And if I'm successful, we're actually going to have Italian plums branches that are actually growing out of what we call the rootstock or the native plum there. And then what'll be great about that is that the, the native plum here will actually pollinate the Italian plum 
Um, and then we'll actually be able to have the two different plums growing out of the exact same bush. Uh, and hopefully that'll actually fruit. So why don't we look at one more wild edible before we uh, wrap things up today? Um, oh, and maybe we'll look at the mushroom logs too, if folks are interested in that. Laura's off with the group right now. So they're, they've walked back into the woods. I'm pretty sure I'll lose my cell reception if I try and follow her. Um, so I'm not gonna, not gonna keep going with her, but I will show you guys a couple other things here quick. So another one of our favorite wild edibles, and this is one that we're actually establishing on the homestead, although you can harvest it off in the wild. This one here is stinging nettle, if you're not familiar with that one. Look at that. And it's just starting to pop up. Let's see if I do it that way and kind of look down. Now, you might be surprised to think that stinging nettle is an edible, but it's actually chock full of nutrients. I would even argue that stinging nettle is probably healthier than uh, are more nutrient dense than most of the vegetables you're buying in your average grocery store. And it grows everywhere. A lot of people think of it as a weed and even an invasive because uh, stinging nettle, well, one, because it stings you, right? So if you uh, were to touch the stem or the underside of the leaf, it's got this thing called formic acid in it. Uh, and it causes like an allergic kind of reaction uh, and you're, you'll get a little bit of swelling and a little bit of stinging. Uh, it doesn't last too long usually, uh, but it can be quite uncomfortable. But that, that formic acid reaction is actually killed as soon as uh, it's kind of, um, well, one, the one way to kill it is to actually cook it. So if you steam it, it basically kills it instantly. So there's a few things that we'll do with the stinging nettle. Um, one of the most common ones is to make stinging nettle tea. So we'll harvest these young green shoots. They're a little small to harvest yet, but give it another week. You know, when they're this tall, we'll cut those fresh leaves off and we'll just put them in the teapot, pour boiling water over it. Uh, that neutralizes this formic acid and then we'll drink it as a tea. Um, and I, I can't even list them all off, but vitamins, minerals, micronutrients, uh, incredibly healthy medicinal stuff. On top of that, it's also a natural spinach source. And, you know, in this time where food prices are going through the roof, when we're having supply chain issues, uh, when I'm really worried about food security and kind of what's around the next corner, um, we're actually, a lot of gardeners are fighting to get the stinging nettle out we're actually allowing this stinging nettle to basically grow anywhere it wants on our homestead because it's a perennial food source that, as I said, I would argue is healthier than most of the vegetables that you're gonna buy in the grocery store. Um, and it comes back every year as a perennial. So it's a phenomenal resource and a phenomenal food um, that's free and comes back every year on its own, takes almost no work. We don't need to weed it, we don't need to tend it. All we have to do is harvest it and consume it. Uh, we also make stinging nettle pesto, um, and one of, if you've ever tried our Damasio spice, so if you look at the link there, uh, www.wildmuskoka.com, uh, we make a, a spice called Damasio. And one of the main ingredients in it is this dried stinging nettle, uh, leaf. And we cut it with some other fun stuff. We, I think there's some oregano in there. We put in, um, what else is in there? There's sesame seeds in there. There's just a touch of salt in there, but it's a phenomenal spice to put on your eggs, uh, put on a baked potato, um, put on a, a salad. We love it on popcorn. Um, so if you want to get some of that good stinging nettle nutrient into your life, then I would suggest trying uh, our gamasio or learning to harvest stinging nettle on your own. So I think I'm going to maybe leave it there for now. We've been going almost 45 minutes here. Um, as I said, if you're just tuning in near the end of this cast, then, um, then just know that um, you may want to go back and watch the beginning because we started this off today with my wife, Laura, um, who was leading a in-person live uh, edible plant walk on our land. Um, and so she talked about dandelions, she talked about violets, uh, she talked about hostas, uh, she talked about evening primrose. So you can go back and watch those at the beginning of those. And I hope you enjoyed this cast. Uh, feel free to leave us some comments, ask some questions. We'll go back in there and check on them. Uh, and if you enjoyed it, then consider sharing this with your friends and go check out all of our wild food and drink treats over at wildmuskoka.com. All right, I'll leave it there, everybody. Signing off. Cheers.